Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. In this episode, we dive into the Jurassic Park film franchise. What did they get right? Plus, Emma Kennedy wants to know if we did find dino DNA, would nature find a way? Hello and welcome to Terrible Lizards. I am Izzy Lawrence and opposite me in the universe um, of the <laughs> internet, because that's how we record this, we're not in the same room, we're COVID safe, um, is the magnificent Dr. Dave Hone. Hello. <laughs> We're, we're COVID safe apart from having both had it. <laughs> yeah, shh. Don't tell everybody our secret. We're fine now. Everything's fine. We're not panicking trying to get all of this done really soon when we said we will because we all had a couple of weeks off. I actually only had a couple of weeks off. Dave was ill for longer. But don't worry about that now. We are both fine. Dave, are you fine? Um, well, the doctor said another two or three months and I should be back to normal. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Um, so um, I've, I'm editing out all the coughs. It's it's good. We hope you are safe and you are well. But that's not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about one of the tragedies th- that COVID has caused in the world is that all the cinemas pretty much shut. And so we cannot go to the cinema and watch movies. But in many ways, I think that Dave would be quite pleased about this because <laughs> Dave is very judgmental when you get onto the topics of film. Uh, no, that's not fair. I'm judgmental about everything. <laughs> Including film, though, Dave, because every single time we talk about semi-lunate carpels, you spit at Steven Spielberg's name and curse him and throw salt and all the rest of it. I, the subject of this podcast is going to be how movies ruin the world uh, and our understanding of dinosaurs. I mean, what are the common misconceptions that people have due to, let's say, let's start with it, let's go Jurassic Park? Yeah, and we've mentioned it multiple times. I mean, I've, I've got a book that I'm writing at the moment, and one of the comments that's come back from the book publishers is, you mention Jurassic Park too often. And it's like, well, I'm trying not to. But if you're writing a general popular science book rather than something that's dedicated for, you know, already dinosaur lovers or dino nerds, that is the single touchstone that almost anyone who ever looks at the book will have. That is their perception of dinosaurs. They may have seen other documentaries and they may have seen other dinosaur movies and yada, yada, yada. But like if there's an instant, what is their picture of dinosaurs? It will be Jurassic Park. And you cannot avoid that in any way shape or form for for better and worse you know obviously for worse it carries a whole bunch of baggage with it but at the same time for better it's easy even if 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 touchstone is wrong if everyone has that same mental picture you can at least say think of that like that but we're starting from scratch is often really really hard imagine a wood pigeon but evil and bigger yeah and with longer legs and the arms don't fit like that and then the tail would need to be over here but only yeah and it it all gets very complicated that's why i don't know any dinosaur educator who does podcasts or blogs or or public talks or anything like that you you kind of sick of jurassic park because you can't not bring it up and even if you don't you will get questions about it constantly because it's the one frame of reference that absolutely everyone has not the sitcom dinosaurs no, no not as much <laughs> Because that that bothered me as a kid, not because you had a load of dinosaurs wearing clothing, but only the top half of clothing, etc. But also that the mother and the father were different species, and, and they all had the kids were they had a herbivore daughter and a T Rex. There was son. a Ceratopsian, yeah. It's- it was all very, very strange. What I liked about that, though, it, that introduced me to the subject of tar pits because I didn't know what a tar pit was until I saw that sitcom on video because I'm that old. Yeah, I was going to say, it was, quite a, it was quite a while ago. Going back to Jurassic Park and, and its impact, what people forget is there was another film in the cinemas at the same time as Jurassic Park based on genetically engineered dinosaurs running around and getting out. This is Carnosaur. Carnosaur. No, I've not seen Carnosaur. Just like Jurassic Park, Carnosaur is a book which, which actually predates Jurassic Park by quite a few years, I believe. And they genetically engineer birds and reverse engineer them into dinosaurs and then they get out. It's actually set in the UK. It's like set in like some farmhouse. But it was made into a film which stars Laura Dern's mother. (laughs) So both of them were in dinosaur films at the same time in the cinema. 
but yeah, there were you know there were loads and loads of films alongside Jurassic Park and pre Jurassic Park. That is one which I think became you know it was almost like Star Wars in the sense that absolutely everyone went to see it. You know, me as a kid, I liked dinosaurs, I liked animals, I did like movies, and I liked stop motion and animation. I was into that, so I'd seen all of Ray Harryhausen stuff. I'd seen One Million Years BC, and I'd seen terrible things like The Land That Time Forgot with Doug McClure and. All of these kinds of things. But, you know, your average person probably hadn't seen those. And if they had, they'd have seen the skeletons fighting. They wouldn't necessarily have seen all the dinosaurs. Yeah, they, they, they'd probably have seen, yeah, seen Jason and the Argonauts being the, more, being the more popular, or Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, and some of his other more, actually genuinely more famous stuff. And there was things like... The Wrong Trousers isn't him, is it? Uh, no, that's Ardman. <laughs> uh, but I'm thinking of uh, things like, there's a film called Caveman, which stars Ringo Starr. <laughs> What? <laughs> yes. Well, uh, the thing everyone, about everyone's... being a, a caveman is... Well, none of them speak English. They, they all speak oh. in kind of grunts and groans, except the Japanese caveman who bizarrely speaks excellent English and no one can understand him as a result. It, it is a comedy, strangely enough. It has a T-Rex getting high on weed and then falling over. Um, but there's loads and loads and loads of stuff out there that the only people who saw it were dinosaur nerds. Um, and you look at some of Ray Harryhausen's stuff, and even, the, you know, we're talking about 60s here, uh, 60s, 70s. It was very accurate for its time, as in up-to-date science, uh, in terms of its depictions and its style. And the animals were quick and running around and agile and could jump and were, you know, they were not... Lumbering. Godzilla-like upright tail dragging very slow cumbersome animals again for for people who really knew their dinosaurs yes jurassic park was something of a leap forward in terms of the technology because they used the computers and then the absolutely giant animatronics but in terms of um doing like super accurate dinosaurs i would argue it was not a massive leap forward from stuff that had been around 15 20 years ago the big difference was the size of the audience that saw it because it's Spielberg. Well, right, and it and it is a it's obviously a very good film, and it made an unbelievable amount of money. And part of the reason it looks so good is because it was a massive Spielberg production, and they could put a ton of money into it. Carnosaur, in contrast, which you know literally came out like a week or two before, there's some clunky rubber puppets that don't move very convincingly a lot of the time. I mean, the reason it's so good cinematically is because it's not about dinosaurs it's about a man learning to be a father and the dinosaurs really are window dressing it's a very spielbergy film in in that regard it's about family and all of that and and actually the books so i i had cause to reread the, the book fairly recently and it's notable how little the dinosaurs are actually in it how little Crichton actually says about dinosaurs he's really not interested in them he doesn't give great graphic descriptions of them he doesn't talk about their biology or the science at any great length what he's really interested in is systems going wrong and ian malcolm getting to be a smart ass and talk about how he saw all of this coming because he's so brilliant and how things will inevitably fail and man hubris which is what a lot of Crichton's books are about and I don't remember that reading it the first time. And obviously the, the way the film is interpreted by people is, yeah, dinosaurs, which is of course what you want because no one wants to go to the cinema and re and watch 20 minute monologues by a bloke in a fever dream on a bed about how he's right. Whereas mostly <laughs> Triceratops and, and Tyrannosaurus are a bit more interesting on film. If you want a really good monster film, I recommend, uh, I think it's Night of the Big Heat, which is, it's Cushing and Christopher Lee um, right. in this amazing thing where they're actually filming it in freezing conditions, but it's meant to be a really hot, you know, thing. So it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And for whatever reason, they filmed it when it was absolutely freezing cold. So they're all sort of shivering, going, gosh, I'm hot. Um, <laughs> But but the thing is, the monster doesn't appear until like five minutes from the end, and you're terrified yeah. at that point because the acting is genuinely very good and the directing is really very good. But then the monster turns out to be a bin liner, and <laughs> <laughs> did it rather lessen the tone? By any it was. It's just. It is a scary trash bag <laughs> on the floor, kind of flat and moving across the floor, and you're not in a sort of Dementor in Harry Potter way either. Yeah. Really, just a bin liner. <laughs> 
But yeah, so I, I think that is the big impact of film. It isn't so much the nature of the dinosaurs that we remember as much as the look of the dinosaurs. Yeah. And what is, I mean, what I remember from watching the documentaries about Jurassic Park is how they moved away from dinosaurs being reptilian. They were going to give the velociraptors flicky out tongues and that sort of thing. Yeah, and they didn't because that's a lizard thing. That's the one thing that Crichton does emphasise in the book is that he says, you know, rapid, fast, jumping, climbing, running, intelligent. So so he, he does angle that and that perhaps gets more attention in the book than it does in the film. But obviously the flip side of all of this is, as I said, it, it's now become a kind of e-day fix in the idea of people's minds. You know, this is what dinosaurs are. You know, the, the gap between Harry Housen's dinosaurs and the first Jurassic Park is the same as, or in fact, less than the original Spielberg Jurassic Park and the Jurassic World sequel, which will be out in a year or two. And yet the Jurassic Park dinosaurs haven't changed. So we've had 25, 30 years of scientific discoveries and improvements to our knowledge and understanding. You know, the first Jurassic Park film came out before I went to university. And I've now had a PhD in dinosaur biology for 12, 15 years. That, that's a pretty big gap. And so you imagine just how much we've learned and discovered and, and that ch- depiction on film hasn't changed one iota. But that's because you're, you've got, you're looking at universe building. See, I am professionally a writer of fiction, historical fiction, but still, you can't just go changing it all because they found you know a new bit of science. You've got to keep the dinosaurs nudy, rudy, without any feathers. This. I totally get and understand that. I'm perfectly capable of watching those films and turning my science brain off and going, yeah, it's a film. I don't care. Were it not for the fact that they themselves have repeatedly edited their dinosaurs between films. Mm, so the true. claim of the filmmakers is, oh, well, of course we haven't put feathers on T-Rex or Velociraptor because it's the same animals. Only they've put teeth in the ornomimosaurs between films. The stegosaurs, they've drooped the tail from being upright to dragging along the ground in later films they've changed the color of them they put those little erectile pseudo feathers in the velociraptors in jurassic park 3 and then got rid of them again so the 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 pteranodons have changed quite a bit so they've they've repeatedly edited their own animals and then claimed that they can't change them and so from that point of view that argument really doesn't stand up and it's also true that when the original film came out you can see the you know there's the pr and the press release stuff and there's little clips of these online people like spielberg sam neil and laura dern saying it's all super accurate we've done loads of research we've made every effort to make these as scientifically accurate as possible within the context of making a movie and that hasn't carried on. <laughs> I'd argue that even like in the later Jurassic Park films, when they are saying, we're genetically updating these dinosaurs and we're creating dinosaurs using different DNA and what have you, the actual argument that the filmmakers are making is that this is a really bad idea, but they're having to do this because it's what the public expects. And you've kind of got this narrative going through it going, we actually don't want to be making our dinosaurs like this. We want to be making them natural, but we can't. It's actually part of the plot of the film. But, right, but they, but, the, but that's the thing. They, they've got themselves into a logical tangle whereby originally they say, you know, we can't, you know, uh, this is in the book and I don't think it makes it into the original film. But in the book, there's a clear thing where Henry Wu, the big geneticist lead, his plan is he wants to cull everything in the park and rebuild them slower and more lizard-like because that's what the public will think the dinosaurs are and so he wants them to meet the public's expectations and (laughs) yeah we're now in the inverse position where the filmmakers are refusing to update them because the public's perception based on their own films alters things and there's that so for people who are not in the uk um for whatever reason over the Christmas period, basically every Jurassic Park film was on. Being eaten is Christmassy. It's, a, it's as Christmassy as Alan Rickman falling off a tower. Yeah. So all five of them have been on, and s- several of them more than once. So I, I have... I haven't been re-watching them because that would imply sitting down and watching them. <laughs> I've, I've had them on whilst doing other things. And there is that line in Jurassic World, I've got to get the right one, 
where they're talking about this very issue when they first make the new one. And Henry Wu, again, says, you've got to understand that these are recreated animals. And if we were able to do this properly, you know, or you were travel back in time, these a lot of these animals would look very different to what we've actually made. And everyone treated that as the filmmakers trying to have an excuse and say, well, yeah, you can argue that they're supposed to have feathers. But as he said, we haven't got the proper DNA. They're kind of genetic monsters, so they're not real. And that excuse would fly were it not for later on in the movie when you see Dr. Wu's secret little lab and he's got a lizard with feathers on it. (laughs) If you can make a lizard genetically engineered with feathers, I'm pretty sure you can make a velociraptor which had feathers genetically engineered to have feathers on it. I'm just going to take this opportunity um, for paleo artists out there. Well, you're drawing your velociraptors with feathers. Can we, um, and you get them lovely on the ulna, you get them lovely on the forearm. Can we also mm-hmm. have them on the hand, please? Because birds have the hand ones as well. There's a, there's a habit of having almost like, well, as you see, Hoatzin, so, so the famous South American bird, which as babies have these kind of little claws on the hands. That's how people often incorrectly draw Velociraptor and the other dromaeosaurs and other bird-like dinosaurs of like, there's a wing all the way down the arm until it gets the fingers and there's just a reptilian hand at the end. And no, yeah, just like modern birds, those feathers continue onto the fingers. You know, the, the claws would stick out and some of the fingers would stick out, but yes, they would they would still be very feathery as You'd well. You'd think it'd be very annoying for them because they'd have to clean those feathers a lot. I understand. Anybody who's worn elaborate cuffs, if you're Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, think that <laughs> when you're designing your velociraptors please can we have them with you know the full length sleeve otherwise they're just going to look you know unflamboyant they were flamboyant <laughs> so other than the look of a velociraptor what else i mean what are the big misconceptions let's go through the big misconceptions that we get from jurassic park well so i mean the the absolute classic one which i'm not sure if we've ever talked about this is, this is the problem of course because we know we both know we talk about lots of stuff that doesn't and also we make talk me. when we're not recording this is the issue that we have <laughs> We don't always know if we said it and recorded it or we recorded it and then edited it out and God, yeah. Anyway, but T-Rex's vision is based on movement. That's, you know, an absolute prime one. And obviously a key plot point in the original film because that's how they hide from it and then they distract it with the flare and absolute nonsense. (laughs) There's no reason to think that whatsoever. I mean, could you tell that anatomically anyway? Is that is that something that you can tell with animals? So, so in the book, Crichton says this comes about. Uh, actually, I think it's in the sequel book. So, in the in the Lost World book, he said it comes about because there was a paper that described the brain cavity of Tyrannosaurus that showed that its optic bulbs, so the bit which would control eyesight, were similar to those of frogs. And frogs do have super reception for things moving. That's why they're really good with shooting tongues out and, and, and grabbing stuff. But A, that's not the same as not being able to see. The idea that frogs can only see things that move. It's like, how would they ever operate? I mean, you, you've got to be able to see other things as well. Otherwise, they go walking into walls all the time. Yeah. Secondly, most animals have bits that are really attuned to move. I mean, we do it all the time. You can be having and you say, oh, I think I saw something out the corner of my eye. Things moving, particularly at the edge of your vision, is the kind of thing that makes you look around. Even a very average human being, say George Bush, he can get out the way of a flying shoe faster than anyone. Better than you'd think. Absolutely. Mm. I'm not aware that this is a real paper. I mean, Crichton is, I'm not going to say guilty because that implies he's done something wrong, but lots of the science in his books is made up. So like all, he talks about a whole bunch of fossil plants and diseases and stuff in the first book. None of them exist. He literally just made up names that sounded good. So I don't, and I've never come across this paper. So I am not aware that there was ever a scientific paper that said tyrannosaur brains are like frog brains for their eyes. Even if they did, there's no reason whatsoever to think that they've got some weird supervision based movement and can't see anything else because frogs don't have that. And also, even if they had a brain that was a bit shaped like a frog, they're still a dinosaur. They are a very, very long way evolutionarily from frogs and lizards and snakes certainly don't have this why would you think that dinosaurs did so it's a absolute nonsense in just about every way 
And the related one is that T-Rex has the greatest sense of smell ever, which I think we have touched on. We did talk about that in the T-Rex episode. We talked about how it's the cavity for the nose is in uh, people that have his brain cavity it, it, or something. It basically got, it got, got confused with the sinuses. They do have a big olfactory bulb. They had a good sense of smell. But the idea that there's some ultimate sniffer dog that can yeah smell absolutely anything a mile away yeah isn't true and Um, they had those massive eyeballs yeah a big eye is one of the things in biology that we really do know with great confidence really big eyeballs correlate with really good eyesight that's not movement based vision in any way shape or form that's the kind of interesting thing that I find as an educator and someone who does like films in general and does like dinosaur movies, and I've watched a lot of schlocky dinosaur movies deliberately, is that there, there is this weird mix where, yeah, the T-Rex is probably a bit fast, um, and well, probably very fast, and it runs straight through a tree trunk, which if it tried to run through a collapsed tree, the T-Rex would break in half before the tree would shatter. <laughs> That's just cinematic. But... On the one hand, it was very accurate for its time. There's stuff in hindsight we would probably say is now different. Like what? So we would now probably say that they had lips and that they didn't have all their teeth hanging out. Um, the eyeballs are a bit shrunken into the head. The shape of the top of the snout is probably wrong. We've got a better idea of some of the scale shapes and patterns on different bits of the animal. I have an issue with some of this, though, because like, you look... Cause I really like the look of the T-Rex in the Jurassic Park films. I think they look scary. I think they look cool. I think, weirdly, they have a lot of expression. And then you look at what happens when you give a T-Rex lips and you give it... And it just becomes this amorphous blob of a head. It's got nothing in it because the muscles aren't there to sort of give it a wink or a smile and you never see them sort of doing duck face or anything. <laughs> they always look at a paleo artist who does a really accurate one. It's just this big loaf of bread. It doesn't look very exciting. Yeah, they're, they're a giant block. Yeah. With the benefit of hindsight, with another 20 years of research, we would tweak. There's a few things at the time which were probably arguable or are subtly wrong, like their arms are rotated wrong, but they're not the big velociraptor giant grabby arms and opening doors. You know, the tiny tucked away little bit of the animal. It doesn't have a proper pubic boot. So the, the big bit of the pelvis that sticks down doesn't really stick out properly at all. But you often don't notice that until you actually really think about it. But in general, that big CG model and the giant full size animatronic that they had on set that was moving around and grabbing stuff is really really very accurate it looks like a real animal but it also looks like how good artists and scientists would have interpreted t-rex at the time and then they give it these bizarre oh it can't see features (laughs) which it's kind of interesting and weird because on the one hand i totally understand it's film it's fiction you're trying to do things that are interesting and exciting and you want to drive the plot and have dramatic moments and that can be incompatible with good science and yet if you're going to do that well why don't you throw the whole thing out the window and do whatever the hell you want and they, they, they seem to be stuck in this weird limbo whereby they're trying to make it as accurate as possible when they accept right up to the point where they don't care at all I sympathise with this though what I really liked about it I think though one of the things I really admired about the T-Rex was they didn't make it run it is walking the way you say I think yes. almost always which allows it to not only be scary and chase things like cars but also a lady in high heels to be able to run away from it quite easily I'm told by a, a colleague who I don't think I'll break any secrets if I reveal his name but I wait a, a, a colleague who was involved in one of the later Jurassic Park films um, told me that he spoke to the animators of the original, in particular, the original sequence of the T-Rex running down the road after the Jeep mm. with them sitting in the back and, you know, the famous objects in the rear view mirror shot of it getting close and said, if they made it run, it looked weird. And so they had it this like super high speed walk. The thing is, apparently, if you actually measure it on screen, you know, if you use some markers, you know, roughly how big the animal is and therefore how long its strides are, you can work out how quickly it's moving. If you do that, you find out it's actually going about half as fast as the Jeep. <laughs> it's, it's all an editing trick because they discovered that if they made it run at like 40 miles an hour to catch the Jeep, the legs are going unbelievably <laughs> fast on this giant thing and it looked ridiculous if only it went me me at the same time <laughs> so what they did is they've slowed it down you know it's it's doing 20 odd miles an hour which is pretty quick so what you see is it cuts the t-rex running along the road 
and then cuts back to the Jeep and then cuts back to the T-Rex and it's much closer. But the actual bit where you see it, it's running about half as fast as the Jeep. It really shouldn't be catching it up. I mean, Crichton's famous for not liking systems. All you need to do there is just have a Jeep that can't, has got something wrong with it, that can't, like, <laughs> stuck in second gear or second, something. Second, can't go very quick, yeah. Exactly, then it's perfect. <laughs> A slow speed chase. This is something, this was a discussion I had. There's a paleo artist called John Conway, who at least some of the listeners will know. John and I had this conversation, I think at his birthday party a few years ago. And we wanted Spielberg to, to remake Jewel, his famous film of a uh, uh, big rig truck basically chasing a car across the desert with a modern T-Rex and a person because the T-Rex is just this big, long-distance runner, but that's not actually very quick. So, you know, a couple of marathon runners in the desert with a T-Rex is a fairly even fight. And that would be a much more interesting and horrible film for an hour and a half with T-Rex just coming down the road after you, not oh. getting tired. Yeah. What about all the herbivores in Jurassic Park? Because they don't get that much attention. Um, are there anything that strikes you as really wrong with them? Well, so, so the Stegosaurus, I mentioned that earlier. The Stegosaurus has, has had a bit of a weird life lifetime. Um, so Stegosaurus first turns up in the second one, The Lost World. Can and I just a... ask very quickly, Stegosaurus, they are Jurassic. Yeah, no, they're late, they're late Jurassic. Okay, cool. That's, they're actually Jurassic, not Cretaceous, so they should be in the film. Yes, they, they, they are one of the rare Jurassic dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. Um, <laughs> So Stegosaurus first turns up in the second film. There's the little family group. We don't know anything about their social di- dynamics, but it's it's plausible. It's fine. Um, and there's um, supposedly a mum and dad and a, and a juvenile. And they're huge. They're about like 50% bigger than they should be. So they're, they're absolutely enormous for no good reason. Because they're, they're big anyway. I mean, you know, it, it, it smashes things up with its tail and the people have to run away. It, you know, a big Stegosaurus that's pissed off and swinging its tail around is very dangerous. You don't need to make it colossal for no apparent reason. But apart from its size... The model is absolutely superb. It, it's about as good a dinosaur as they ever made in terms of its accuracy. Why did they make it so big then? And how big were st- um, stegosaurus? I don't... Because I don't, most of the skeletons are in the US. I've seen original stegosaurus skeletons, but I don't think I've ever stood next to a really big one. This is We've talked about this a bit with dinosaurs. This is one problem we have with our perceptions, even my perceptions. I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I mean, I've seen an awful lot of dinosaurs. and You've I know climbed inside a T-Rex. I have. I, I, and I... And I fall foul of this trap is that, you know, their size is ranged enormously. You know, you look at crocodiles, you can go to a zoo and you can see a three, three and a half meter long crocodile and go, oh my God, that's enormous. Yeah, but there are six meter crocodiles out there, which is just so much bigger. And it, it's a similar thing. Like I stood next to triceratops skulls and gone, wow, this is a big animal. And then I've seen photos online of one literally twice the diamond, you know, literally twice as long and twice as wide. And you're like... Oh, I thought that was how big they got. They get that big. So I I think a big stegosaurus, you would be, well, we're about the same height, but, you know, we're six foot, we're we're fairly tall people. The, The top of our heads would be getting up to the top of their thighs. Wow. You know, maybe eight feet, so two and a half meters to the top of the pelvis because of course they've got this very kind of up, semi-circular shape almost and then of course you've got the plates on top so they're really still you know three meter plus animals to the top of the plates but these ones you know the, the people are coming up like halfway up their knees um, mm. they're like three and a half four meters tall so they're really quite too big but apart from that they're brilliant and then Stegosaurus next turns up in Jurassic World they might have because there's some fleeting cameos they might have a yeah. fleeting cameo in the third one but they, they turn up properly in, in Jurassic World and they've moved the tail down. So Stegosaurus, we think, has this very kind of horizontal tail, so parallel to the ground. And now they've got it as like a 1960s tail dragger. They've actively changed that model and brought the tail swooping down and almost dragging along the ground. So the size is now right, but there's no reason for that profound shift in, in body shape, except to make them look more like the average bad kids dinosaur books with a 1960s reconstruction in it. 
Uh, which is therefore a great example of them mucking around with the models for their animals that they can't change for for because they want to be consistent, except they're not consistent. They're actively making them more wrong. But then the argument in that film is that they're deliberately making the animals more attractive for tourists. So maybe that's the reason they've actually bred the Stegosaurus to be like that or to look wrong. Them. Except that literal popular real world culture has changed because of the depictions in early Jurassic Park films. <laughs> there's, there's a there's a there's a massive recursiveness of real world fiction interactions going on that's well maybe they were sick i mean you know i know when my cat's ill they don't do the happy tail they do the sort of slightly (laughs) sad tail sad draggy tail what about the big sauropods in jurassic park are they relatively accurate so the original brachiosaurus is the one that you first see at the top of the hill is very good um it then cuts to a shot of several of them walking out of a lake where they'd have floated because they're somehow submerged which isn't very um good and then again they're barely in it you get them feeding in the trees later in the first one they're barely in it again until we get to jurassic world where there's a momentisaurus so the really super long-necked one which i think we have mentioned from china turns up in the second one in jurassic park two and that's actually pretty well done but you you barely see it they kind of drive past it in a motorbike and that's about it um and then you get multiple shots of the big um apatosaurs and diplodocids in jurassic world and they look awful they look like these horrible elephant skinned wrinkly things that look like low honestly they look like the peter jackson king kong where he said he deliberately made them look like the original ones and i'm like Mm. So they look like they're from 1933. And that's fine in 1933, and that's fine in 2005 or whatever it was. If you're making an homage to 1933, it's a bit rough in 2015 uh, when you're saying that they're accurate. They just don't look like real animals. But there's also, saying on herbivores in general, there's this thing, certainly in Jurassic World, where you know they've got like the giant glass hamster balls that people are driving around, and they've got like the petting zoo. Um, and it's all all these herbivorous species um and people are walking around freely with them or, including or ankylosaurs of things well, yeah and, and or driving around their little and okay there's supposed to be an armored glass dome but it's but you, you have the shot of people literally paddling a canoe down the river with all of these dinosaurs lining the banks and even a couple of them like swimming past and you're like that's ludicrously unsafe you're you're <laughs> I mean, hippos um, it, kill a lot of people. That's hippos. Well, right, but it, and, and but it. I think it goes back, and this. I'm, I'm slowly making my way back to your question. I think this goes back to this perception people have that herbivores are basically safe because they're herbivores and carnivores are basically dangerous because they're carnivores. And yeah, if if you want to know what frightens locals in, in South Africa, it's hippos and water buffalo rank so far above lions, it's untrue because they're so unbelievably dangerous. Um, I've worked with a Noah. So these are dwarf buffalo from Sulawesi and they are one of the most dangerous things I've ever seen. I've worked with peccary. Um, so, Those you know, are pigs, big, aren't they? Yeah, South American pigs. Again, I, I spent about six months in Peru uh, doing conservation work in, out in the, in the Amazon basin. There are jaguars down there. There are puma. There are anaconda and um torpedo rays and piranha and all kinds of lethally venomous snakes and you know spiders and um all kinds of nasty ants and stuff I don't think spiders are going to try and catch you and eat you though <laughs> no but there are th- you know you've got to be very careful where you put your hands yeah. there's things like tangarana trees that have these super nasty bullet ants that live like, yada 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 the one thing the locals are afraid of is peccaries these knee-high pigs because they run around in big groups and their default to everything is attack. That is literally their defense. If they are nervous or worried about anything, they charge and attack. And th- that's it. And the the locals are understandably terrified of them. And I worked with some of them at London Zoo. And yeah, they were absolutely, unbelievably vicious. And pigs have really nasty teeth and really strong bites and the idea that yeah they're knee high but the idea that like 15 or 20 of these would come at you you're dead you've just got no hope whatsoever and so yeah just this oh all the dinosaurs are just there with the people it'll be fine they're herbivores (laughs) no (laughs) yeah some of them will be placid i've worked with some big there's a thing called bongo these beautiful big orange antelope i've worked with giraffe 
they are genuinely placid animals. They, if you are used to them and you've worked with them and they've, uh, the animals themselves have had that experience, it can be very safe to work physically with those animals inside the same enclosure. I mean, elephants, they're dangerous, but they're, they're very, you know, placid. Right, but sadly, keepers are still killed semi-regularly by elephants and these are experienced people and the, you know... And, and yet killer whales, who are killer whales, who eat meats and they're very they don't seem to attack humans very much and the ones who do are just incredible they're usually you know in captivity and very stressed out in in the wild generally not in in captivity yes they have a they have as we've discovered they have a they have a track record of it they're a bit stressed out and go bad because individual animals have different personalities i've worked with um arabian oryx and most of them were fine but one of them just attacked everyone because that's what that animal was like and so yeah e- even if you've got a relatively placid species which is used to being people around it's it's clearly a very very bad idea i would not go anywhere near an ankylosaur just you just wouldn't yeah and the other thing is just accidents happen you know the the safest most placid nice animal in the world can unexpectedly have a bad day or get a bee sting on the bum or or just slip and fall. Cows slip and fall over. What do you think happens when a <laughs> bloody sauropod that's 30 tonnes slips and falls over next to the people who are just canoeing past? It's like, no, don't do that. <laughs> Okay, I want to ask finally about, I think it's a Jurassic World thing, um, the sort of, I don't know if it's a plesiosaur or what it's meant to be. Oh, the giant mosasaur, yeah. Yeah, talk to me about that. The big that. aquatic one. What is that? Well, so so, so it's a mosasaur, so we, we haven't done marine reptiles. And Not we're, yet, well we we're will hoping, do. We're hoping to do, yeah. we're hoping to do a marine, Special. marine reptiles are a long way out of my normal area, so we'll, we'll, we'll wait till we've got someone else who knows a bit more about them. So mosasaurs are big marine reptiles. They're not dinosaurs. They're, they're quite distantly related. We have good reason to think they're actually not not just lizards, but specifically close to monitor lizards. Ooh. So they have a deep evolutionary history, which is tied to a specific branch of, of lizard evolution. And they're very, very big. They have four flippers. Are they as uh, big as they are in that film? That one in the film is about twice as big as it should be. So we we have some bits of giant mosasaurs. There were lots of big mosasaurs, and I mean seriously big, you know, T-Rex sized swimming and swimming mosasaurs absolutely with, you know, great big heads with great big teeth. So they they have very big heads. So there's actually literally dozens of groups of aquatic reptiles at various times, including in the Mesozoic. The three big ones, which everyone's vaguely familiar with, is ichthyosaurs, which basically look a bit like dolphins, but their tail goes sideways instead of up and down. Plesiosaurs, which are the stumpy body with a great big long neck, which we're going to have to reference Loch Ness monster yeah. type animals. And then the mosasaurs are the big headed, almost like a crocodile, but kind of with flippers rather than legs. That's a terrible description, but big head, big body, not especially streamlined compared to the other two. And these are interpreted as like big macro, but you know, they're, they're shark slash killer whale type things that are going after other big animals so either big fish or other marine reptiles and stuff like that there's lots of them we've got an excellent fossil record for them we've got them with embryos inside we've got them with skin and various other things Ah. um there's some really big ones there was one that was came up i think it's from svalbard which had a documentary made about it that's a cold place to dig i know we were talking it it is we've Mm -hmm. we've talked about your this will come up because this is the thing i don't know when it will be but we've talked about you and your pants in your pants I think yes. that was with Adam Rutherford so hopefully we'll have already done the image of you but, you couldn't <laughs> dig and swell bad in just your pants and some sandals and sunglasses no no probably not <laughs> it would have to be a very warm day it does get warm I did, I did a podcast about the Arctic and it gets up to 35 oh it gets hot yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so they dug up this big Mosasaur in Svalbard. There was a documentary about it, I want to say like 10, 15 years or so ago now. Obviously, for hype and publicity reasons, it was dubbed Predator X. And it was just a big Mosasaur. And it's really cool. And it's a really big Mosasaur. But it was obviously hyped as this super giant hyper normo predator. With lasers. Predator X is, again, I 
I'm not a, I'm not a marine reptile worker. As far as I'm aware, Predator X is about as big as mosasaurs get, and it's about half the size of the one in Jurassic World. So yeah, yeah. they more than a bit overdone it. <laughs> But like I say, I mean, the thing with um, the Jurassic World in particular is they do talk a lot about how they're all genetically modified. And I tell you what, we've got somebody with a question about genetic modification. So let's go over to our guest, Magnificent, the wonderful. She's a hero of mine. She writes books. She's an actress. She does everything. It's Emma Kennedy. With all of that. Hello, Emma Kennedy. Oh, hello, Izzy Lawrence. Hello, Dave. Hello. <laughs> How oh, are you? I'm, I'm, I'm almost bursting to ask my questions about dinosaurs. Well, before you do, I want to know if you... Because I know you're quite tomboyish in your own little way because you love Lego. Yes. And I love I Lego. I love Lego. I've got four Lego Velociraptors. Have you? Excellent. Have yes, you got the I big have, Jurassic yeah. Park gates? No. You should get that. No, I haven't awesome. done that I know one, someone yeah. who does. <laughs> <laughs> it is good. It is very for, good. For, for, for people who are not live in this video call, Izzy is waving and looking guilty, but that doesn't translate <laughs> well to audio. True. However, um, so, so I mean, do do your do your, does your passion for dinosaurs lie beyond Lego? Well, I wouldn't say I have a deep relationship with dinosaurs, but I'm a great fan of uh, the Jurassic Park films. And I, I have such a vivid memory of sitting on the front row in an Odeon somewhere in London. I think it was in North London somewhere and seeing Jurassic Park for the first time. And that moment uh, when, when they arrive on the island and they see the, um, uh, the, the big dinosaurs for, for the very, very, very first time. And I can remember just literally going, holy. <laughs> I, it's like I, you couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't believe it because at that, at that point, dinosaurs in films were rubbish. They were like the old King, King Kong movies. They were you know, made of plasticine or whatever and, and did not look real. But the thing that, that Jurassic Park did that was just like, it was like your, your eyes getting a Christmas present for the first time. It, it was like you really genuinely felt you were in a cinema seeing something that hadn't been done before. And this was the first time it had ever happened. And that was Jurassic Park. So should we ruin it for her, Dave? Should we spend? <laughs> or should we ask so, her so if 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 <laughs> if I'm allowed to ask my question, my my first question is: Could Jurassic Park ever happen? No, <laughs> <laughs> I can I can I can dash that one wonderfully comprehensively. I'm afraid. Um, I've, hang on, I've got a question. Mm-hmm. If if they can make Dolly the sheep and they can do cloning and all of that now, there will surely somewhere be a scrap of, of dino DNA. Surely somewhere. And what, So why can't they do it? I will attempt to contract a obviously very long and complicated answer, but the, the really short version is, no, we don't have any dinosaur DNA at all. What? Yeah, it, it just doesn't survive. So, I mean, the, the last dinosaurs died out 65-ish million years ago. DNA under exceptional, extraordinary circumstances can survive a few hundred thousand years. And even then, it's not usually in very good condition. Not even in, in amber with a mosquito? No. <laughs> Unfortunately not. It. So that, that's, that, it, that's your problem is you've just got such a monumental gap that genetic material won't survive and even if it did survive let, let's say you could drill into a mosquito yes. and you could pluck out a complete dinosaur blood cell with a complete chromosome you know with the complete dna in it um i don't think we've actually even got the technology well we've got the technology to like scan that and read it but to make appropriate copies of that um, is really difficult of like in a whole genome so like the entire dna and then you've got to shove that in some kind of proto egg cell which will then develop into an adult which is itself a whole totally sweet different suite of problems which we haven't begun to tackle yet this is now making me want to ask this question which isn't dinosaur related but could is it in theory in theory with with cloning technology obviously it will improve could you eg go into the tomb of charles dickens or another great phenomenal writer or artist or you know 
pop singer or whatever take a scrap of their dna and clone them for could, could we, i mean what i'm saying is could we bring back david bowie um i'm not enough of a geneticist to begin to answer that my my suspicion is in a few decades probably though wow. of course what you'd be doing is bringing them back as a as a be, baby well yes. right but right but it's again you know gosh nurture, wouldn't that be fascinating well it's though, a, it's if, a classic question back... of nurture versus nature because it, he would have the he wouldn't grow up in the same way in the same environment with the same people and and people alter you know even just you know developmentally you know in the womb etc there will be differences that are happening there just because of some random little changes mm. so it might come out looking quite a lot like him it, it would be bitterly disappointing would it not if you cloned david bowie and brought him back and obviously all the na- all the world was watching and he became an accountant <laughs> yeah <laughs> on the other hand that would be spectacular <laughs> I don't know. I don't, no one would get. No one. No one would recover. <laughs> yeah, I mean, constantly reinvented himself, yes. re- re- genetically reconstituted, and goes into chartered accountancy. So okay. So basically, my dream of of real Jurassic Park is is never going to happen. No, I mean, there, there are people who've been playing that. around with the genetics of birds because you do get basically remnant genes of your ancestors float around in your in your DNA. This, this, this is a very common phenomenon um, because genetic development is really complicated. Um, and occasionally things that are normally turned off can turn back on. Uh, and these are called atavisms. Uh, so a, a one that turns up periodically in humans is actually a relatively long tail. Um, there, there are still people who, who will grow a tail. And so the genes for things like this are still sitting in birds or at least some of them and so geneticists and developmental biologists have been playing with this and they've grown a longer tail in a bird so a bony tail uh, and the got some kind of i think they're pseudo teeth rather than true teeth but the jaw is changing and producing teeth because these used to be present and there's an idea floating around that eventually will do the genetic engineering necessary to turn a bird back into a dinosaur Mm -hmm. but of course it won't really be one birds split off from dinosaurs 150 million years ago so they've been evolving to be a different animal for 150 million years that's really quite a long time i mean by by you know mammals at this point were little mouse like things so you know that that's like taking a monkey and going well we've given it a bit of a longer tail and we've made its limbs shorter and it's got a longer (laughs) nose with some whiskers look it's a cretaceous mouse and it's like it really isn't it it sort of looks a bit like one, but it's really not the same thing. Yes. Um, so, I mean, that that is much more plausible and possible. How much of a dinosaur it really is, is up for debate. Those, those awful carbon copy sheets that you used to have to deal with. It's, it's the third or fourth generation <laughs> carbon copy sheet where, yeah, a couple of the letters sort of readable. And I think it had an arrow on it, but it's not really a, a document that you got at the start. I've, I've got two other questions about dinosaurs that's quite short. Uh, but the first is, is there any creature, any creature on the earth alive today, whether it, perhaps it might be at the very bottom of the sea, but is there any creature on earth that is technically still a dinosaur? Uh, yes, the answer is all birds. So all living birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs and therefore are dinosaurs. Oh, that's super. So See, that, was, that was a short answer, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it is. That's, but, it, but yeah, it means there's 10, uh, the, the, I think the number at the moment is about 10,500 bird species. So there's about 10,500 species of dinosaurs alive at the moment. That's pretty awesome. Okay, so my next question is, when, when, you're, when you're looking at uh, dinosaurs as represented in film, mm. they're generally pretty much always the same colour. Yeah, it drives me up the wall. (laughs) Now, how accurate is that? So mostly not very. So dinosaur colour has come up a few times on the podcast. So we, we, we do now have the capacity to look at some of the colours and patterns of some species. Um, so basically you get these little colour packets in the cells. Those on very rare occasions preserve. We can see them and because we can see them, we know what colour they were. So we can go, OK, that bit was red and that bit was brown or that bit was white. That misses a lot of subtlety because there's other things that make colour beyond that. 
it misses a lot of subtlety because not all animals are the same color and the same pattern even for the same species and it's only a handful of them that have been done so the vast majority we actually have no real idea but i would agree that dinosaurs on film have a they're sort of car they're always khaki green aren't they yeah, that's uh, yeah. it and, and and in all kinds of other media as well uh, i mean it's not just the films it's documentaries and books and and people's artwork often yeah imagine if t imagine if tyrannosaurus rexes were actually white with blue spots right so i mean is that possible but then we move into what i'd call like informed speculation so we don't know but we can make some reasonable guesses yes. so you don't tend to get big white animals with blue spots particularly <laughs> not carnivores because a key bit of a carnivore is it's got to get close to the herbivores before it's going to attack them and the okay. bigger and brighter it is the less likely that is going to work Okay, it doesn't have the blue spots, but polar bears, polar bears, they're big and white. Right, and we, we have some big tyrannosaurs in cold environments. They could be white. Cheetahs and jaguars, they are essentially Spotty. yellow with they're, they're yellow with brown spots. The, they are, and they're often making use of certain types of cover, particularly Savannah. grasses or dappled light through trees, which mm. make certain patterns, and therefore mm. those spots work well. Mm. So, so where, where was Tyrannosaurus rex predominantly hunting? T. Rex specifically, so it's it's definitely in a band of North America of kind of the upper third of the USA and the lower third of Canada. Oh, so it it's almost been certainly white. much wider than that. We just don't find the fossils because there isn't rocks of the right age available. Dave, Dave do we think T-Rex could have been white like a polar bear? It's not impossible. If it was in a snowy tundra. I would be very surprised if it didn't get into places that were pretty cold in winter and saw snow. And in that context, it's not impossible. <laughs> <laughs> we do have at least one, not T-Rex, we have another large tyrannosaur from uh, China, a thing called Eutyrannus. Eutyrannus is still a big animal, um, seven, eight metres long, half a tonne. Um, it had long, shaggy feathers that would look a lot like fur. And that where Eutyrannus lived would have been very cold in, very cold in winter. And there's every reason to think that there was lots of snow on the ground. I can easily imagine that animal was white or molted into white in winter and certainly some people have illustrated it like that how thrilling so yeah it's it's plausible but that's the thing we we, we often don't know but there are a lot of plausible options people don't make use of those plausible options yes it's not going to be pink and brown with yellow spots and blue stripes but it could be something a bit more interesting than gray brown which is what they all seem to go for far yes. far too often yes what about um sexual selection now i mean could you have peacock dinosaurs do we think um there's a dromaeosaur so one of the bird-like so very velociraptor like animals so very similar size shape yeah uh, from east again from eastern china and it's covered in feathers and those appear to be iridescent mm, now fancy quite, quite what degree of iridescence because obviously you get things like starlings and you get things like magpies yes which in the right light have this beautiful purple blue or green sheen to them yes but are still relatively dark animals and then you have things like some hummingbirds head you know the green head on mallards and things like this which are also iridescent but really bright and sparkly oh proper jazz paws and i i don't think we know where on that spectrum it would lie but as we both know as i say you know a, a magpie in the sun is actually really quite a stunningly bright animal and so yes. even if they did look very black most of the time in dull light these could still be really quite how much would you have lo loved to have seen uh, some of the mating rituals of the male dinosaurs with their big jazz paws oh, just, oh, just yeah. giving it I mean, everything they've got that's another kind of aspect of the appearance is that we you know we we can reconstruct a lot of stuff very accurately you know we can work out where muscle groups go all over the body and how big they are and what they're controlling we know about skin surface and skin textures and scale sizes in different places we can do all of that stuff really very accurately indeed but a lot of the soft tissue stuff we miss. So you look at things like frogs or frigate birds and howler monkeys and things mm. that inflate mm. these giant throat mm. pouches. That will not leave any trace on the bones and is such thin skin that it almost never preserve. 
So we don't know what kind of absurd soft tissue features like that we might be completely missing. And some people illustrate this, and, and there are some really good paleontological artists out there. I'm friends with quite a few of them, and some of them do like ludicrously elaborate things like these enormous furl, you know, big sauropods, things like Brachiosaurus, you know, with huge, great purple and blue and red shiny bulges coming all the way out, you know, not just of the throat, but like all the way down that enormous long neck blown and people are like, that looks stupid and it's like no there's a whole bunch of animals that have that <laughs> it looks ridiculous but actually it's perfectly plausible i mean it is at least plausible we know a whole bunch of animals in different groups all of which have independently evolved that kind of thing as part of their mating displays <sighs> Who knows which dinosaurs may have done something similar? As well as the as well as the sort of we don't know what they look like. I think there's a really good case for them to be multicolored and everything else simply because of how good their eyesight was. Yeah, so that I mean that that gets overlooked as well. I think so. The 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 classic argument for why we make all dinosaurs look like that is well, hippos and elephants and rhinos and crocodiles and whales and really big animals tend to be pretty much one colour and in terms of the land animals they tend to be kind of grey grey or green. Orcas. Orcas are black and white. Right. But then it starts to break down if you actually look at that. Um, the Sumatran rhino is really quite bright orange. That doesn't fit this pattern. Even some of the really big Nile crocodiles are surprisingly bright yellow. Giraffes, for goodness sake. Asian elephants, some of them are actually really quite pink. Hippos are really quite pink on the underside. This idea that big animals are just grey-brown. A, it's a very tiny sample size, and B, it basically isn't true. Steven Spielberg's an idiot, isn't he? I've lost all respect for Spielberg. Oh, we haven't even gone into the semi-lunate carpal muscles. Yeah, if, if you... <laughs> If you look at some of the design specs that were done for Jurassic Park originally, yes. the colours were actually rather brighter. The Velociraptors were supposed to be tiger striped. They were orangey with black stripes, which is how they're described in the book. And then they ditched it. The oh. T-Rex was supposed to be really quite green, relatively bright in some of the illustrations, and then they muted it. And even the, the one bright coloured one that they did, the Dilophosaurus, the one with the, the frill that opens Yes, up. I and love that. The, fr the frill is an example of something that we really don't know about, which is plausible. Um, but that, if you look at the actual model they made and the photographs of it in the studio, it's really bright red and yellow with, with black and white flecks. And then, of course, the only time you see it is in a rainstorm in a car headlight. In and the so dark. It doesn't yeah. show up very well mm. at all. So they made one brightly coloured dinosaur and then didn't show it to you. The, the one that really annoys me, actually, is in Jurassic Park 2. I'm aware of its work, yes. The, the, there's a shot relatively early on in the film where the, the relative bad guys have turned up on the island and they're trying to catch the dinosaurs and they're driving into this big herd and Pete Postlethwaite's character says, Oh, yes. Get, yes. get that one, the one with the red horn. Yes. I know exactly the one you mean. Yep. Parasaurolophus, so this duck billed dinosaur, this huge horn off the back of its head. And then they actually have the guys trying to capture it in broad daylight. And its horn isn't red <laughs> at all. It has the tiniest bit of redder shading compared to the rest of the animal. So even when they name check it in the script as the one with the red horn and show it in broad daylight, they haven't bothered to colour it red. Let's just burn all of our Jurassic Park DVDs. Let's burn them. Burn them. Burn them. <laughs> I mean, there's blue in the later ones, isn't there? Yeah, there the is a blue, bit of blue. Which is, which yeah, is blue. There's, blue. That, there's, there's, that, there's that crazy looking one, the one that swallows the mobile phone in Jurassic Park Oh, the Park Spinosaurus, 3. yes. Yeah, the Spinosaurus, yeah. The initial point I was making was about the eyes and how they got very good eyesight and therefore yes. and they could see more colours. And therefore, they should be more sparkly. Yeah, sorry, I skipped over that. But yeah, that, that's also a very good point. You know, mammals mostly have limited colour vision. Reptiles generally don't, though crocodiles probably do, at least in part because of how they live and their ancestry. But there's no reason to think that dinosaurs didn't have spectacular colour vision. And therefore, yeah, if you if you can see in UV and with much greater uh, colours and range than we can, there is no reason that certainly the displaying animals wouldn't want to exploit that. 
Um, mm. The flip side of that, of course, is if it's really, really important to stay hidden, you've got to make yourself dark and be, you know, you, you know, obviously e- evolution would select four is the correct phrase. Maybe they, they, they were some that, that were like chameleons that could change their skin colour, like octopuses. So so until recently, we assumed that wouldn't happen because... Octopi, although, sorry, octopi. O- well, octopodes, I think. Octopodes, <laughs> if we're being sorry. really fancy. Um, so chameleons are famous for changing colour, but actually it's a whole bunch of lizards and other reptiles that change colour as well. Mostly nothing like as bright or as dramatic a colour change, but it's quite normal for various lizards to get a bit brighter or a bit darker and particularly to flush certain bits. But as far as we knew, crocodiles didn't do it, couldn't do it, and we know birds don't, and therefore the assumption was that dinosaurs don't, except recently we found that some crocodiles can change colour a bit. Not much, but there are baby... I think it's I think it's actually Thomas Stoma, which is better known as the false gharial. Uh, this Indonesian big crocodile with a relatively slender snout. There was a lovely little paper about four or five years ago now that showed that juveniles, when kept in the dark and then suddenly exposed to light, were changing colour in response to that. And we simply thought this was beyond the capacity of, of crocodiles. We now know it wasn't. Well, if it's not beyond the capacity of crocodiles, that means it might well have been inherited from their ancestor because they would then share it with other lizards. And that would mean it could be ancestral to dinosaurs as well. I can at least imagine now some scaled dinosaurs were flushing, you know, flushing a brighter green when they're in daylight, flushing darker when they're in darkness and subtly shifting their colours to make themselves a bit more camouflaged or make displays Mm. a bit brighter. Mm. So you could have a T-Rex up in Canada where it's white during the daytime in winter Mm. and then during the evening it goes a bit darker, maybe a bit bluer to fit in with the (laughs) moonlight you know as it instead of all of it being blue for that reason to make make it match the you know the general moonlight and everything else maybe it's it's white and just part spots of it are blue and then you can have your t-rex with blue spots gotcha dave thank did you it. Well done. <laughs> thank you that's great have we answered your questions emma to yes your you have thank you very much yes the, the the questions have been answered to my satisfaction mm. i do not require my money back thank you <laughs> excellent and emma kennedy i will be on emma, emma kennedy's bookshelf i think in october at some point so get on find emma kennedy on the facebooks and find her she's got loads of twitter things and she makes lego her lego stuff is very good oh i haven't seen that no no oh I've she looked. makes lego she does it in and she talks while she makes it and it's quite relaxing it's quite good i only had one in 2020 one lego building experience and that was the jurassic park gate with the massive t rex but i mean talk about we talked about how the mosasaur was out, out of scale well that t-rex compared to a lego man oh to the minifigures yeah is i mean we're looking at it's, up to it's the quite hip, a bit too big up to the hip you're looking at 10 or 12 minifigures high yeah. so <laughs> yeah that's that um too big that's heading for kind of brachiosaurus size t-rex <laughs> If you've got any questions regarding uh, films or depiction of dinosaurs that you've seen, do send us an email. It's terriblelizardspod at gmail.com or you can get in t- touch with us on our Patreon page. If you do that, send us a message and we can answer your questions. If you've seen a dinosaur and you want it explaining how accurate it is, how inaccurate it is, let us know. If you've got any other questions regarding dinosaurs, do send us your questions. Other than that, big thank you to Emma Kennedy um, and a big thank you to Dave Hone. That's him there looking at me going, what, what are you doing? I've tried to wrap up the episode, Dave. That's all it is. So it's a Rawr. from me and it's a Rawr. from Dave. Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast with Izzy Lawrence and Dr. Dave Hone. This episode was only made possible thanks to our patrons on Patreon and for listeners like you who share our content with your friends. So please spread the word on social media. You can find us on Patreon, Facebook, and at ISZI underscore L-A-W-R-E-N-C-E and at D-A-V-E underscore H-O-N-E on Twitter. Include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. Ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com We are hoping to bring you so much more, but we can only do that if our audience continues to grow. So please like, share and subscribe.